Ave Maria. Always when we add the gospel, always we should try to enter into the mystery. Because all that has been recorded for us by the, by, the apostle, by the evangelists has been given to them by the Holy Spirit. And obviously the Spirit wishes us to, as St. Paul says, rise to the full knowledge of Christ Jesus. And so if we look at the beginning of the passage, we're told Jesus crossed the sea and came to his own city. At the end, we heard that the paralytic went to his own house. And what is the connection? We can ask, where is the city of Christ? And where is the house that the paralytic cured went to? Well, surely it must be Paradise. It's a parable, in a sense, it's an event that actually happened, but it's a parable. And how can we say that the man went to his own house in paradise? Because our Lord called him son. And therefore, if he is a son, he is heir. And we are heirs to that which Christ, our brother, has won for us. He's made us children of the Father in heaven. And so our blessed Lord crosses the sea. He's come down from heaven to earth. When he arrives at his, in his own city, Capernaum, the seaport, it was the place where he lived throughout his ministry. Although he was a citizen of Nazareth, remember when he went to preach in Nazareth, the people were enraged and they made an attempt on his life. And so he moved to Capernaum. And some people heard about his return. And they had a friend who was paralyzed. And they brought him to the Lord. And we're told by St. Matthew that Jesus seeing their faith not the faith necessarily of the man paralyzed, it's in the plural, but in his friends who carried him. Yet the man must have had some faith because he permitted himself to be carried in public to the Lord. St. Luke and St. Mark give us more details. They tell us the crowd was so dense they had to climb onto the roof and lower the man down. But Matthew's brief. The Lord looks and he sees their faith. And from this we can learn something very important. That the Lord doesn't look on us only as individuals disconnected with each other, but he looks at us as a community as well. Because after all, we are in his mystical body. So we approach him as a community, we approach him individually. In other words, we are dependent on the prayers of others. We call it the communion of saints. What did the man want? He's paralyzed. Obviously, he wanted to be freed from his paralysis. But what does the Lord do? What does he say? The Lord seen their faith, said to the, to the man sick of the palsy, be of good heart, courage, cheer up, thy sins are forgiven thee. Be of good heart, son, your sins are forgiven thee. How would the man, do you think, respond? How would you respond? You're paralyzed. You can do nothing for yourself. And you go to someone who could help, and he says, be a good heart, son. 
My child, your sins are forgiven. There would perhaps be disappointment, even annoyance. Who wants to be called a sinner in public? We are, but we don't like it. And so, our Lord is doing several things in this. He's showing us, teaching us, that one, some sicknesses are due to sin. Not all, but some. And in the case of this man, sin was the cause of his issues, his medical issues. In another story, the man by the pool of Siloam, who lay there for 38 years, our Lord cured. And later on, he would say to the man whom he found in the temple, do not sin again, or something worse may befall you. Thirty years paralyzed, and there's something worse than that? In this world, perhaps not. But again, our Lord is showing that some illnesses, and particular paralysis, as a symbol, not in, in itself, is a cause of sin. Because a paralyzed person can do nothing for himself or herself. Yet, sickness is not necessarily, as I said, given because of sin. We think of Job, a just man. Why was he afflicted with this terrible disease? It was terrible. Well, it was to show the power of God, and more important, the wickedness of the enemy. Paul was given a thorn of Satan. He asked for it to be taken away. It was a sickness. We're not sure what it, is, what it was. It may have been something with his eyes. But when he asked for it to be taken away, my power is made perfect in weakness. In the case of Job, Job glorified God because of his continued faith in God's goodness and his mercy. So God is glorified in this. The man born blind is another example. For the Pharisees, he was a sinner. But when the disciples asked, why was he born blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents? He said, no, he was born blind for the glory of God. So sickness and afflic affliction, a disability, can also be for the glory of God, provided we accept it, embrace it, and trust in God's goodness. So here, in this case, we have the man who is paralyzed, and the Lord says, my son, and therefore he has entered into the family of God, your sins are forgiven. We have the scribes. They said within themselves, he blasphemes. Why do they say this? Because only God can forgive sin. It's as simple as that. It says right through the scriptures, only God can forgive sin. And that's logical because sin is an offense against God. And therefore the one who's offended is the only one who can remit and so for, our, for the scribes, our Lord saying your sins are forgiven, they think he's usurping the divine power. They think he's making a claim to be God. So what does the Lord do? The Lord shows that he is God because one, he reads their hearts. Who can read the heart except God alone? I'm the Lord who reads the heart. We think of um, Samuel, who was sent to anoint the son of Jesse. And when Samuel arrived, he saw the first son. He said, ah, here's the Lord's anointed. This is the one. The Lord said, not so. Man judges by appearances. God reads the heart. And there are many other examples where again and again, it says only God can read the heart. Not even an angel can read the heart. 
And so the Lord reads their heart. And in so doing, he is showing that he is God. So Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say arise and walk. So our Lord, one, has read the heart. He has made it known to them by word that he knows what they're thinking. He calls their thoughts evil because there is malice in it. He then asks a question, which is easier, to say your, to say your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Well, which is easier? In words, it is easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Because no one can prove whether or not the sin has been forgiven. How do you show that? It's something invisible. But indeed, it's easier to heal the body. Because the forgiveness of sins requires the shedding of blood. And only the blood of the God-man, only the blood of the Savior can free us from our sins. And so the Lord is already anticipating this forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood. And so he's, having said this, he's asked the question, they're pondering the answer. And so he's going to prove to them by deed. So he's shown knowledge of what they're thinking. He's asked this question, he's put it clearly before them in words, and now by deeds. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin, he said to the man paralyzed, arise, take up thy bed and go to your house. The healing of the soul is invisible. The healing of the body is very visible. God only works miracles to confirm a truth. God will not confirm with a miracle something that's false. The man had been paralyzed and he lay on a pallet, on a bed. He was being carried. He could do nothing for himself. He couldn't walk, and he was being taken. The Lord reverses all of this. He said to him, arise. So he who could not get up, got up. Take up thy bed. He who was being carried, now carries the thing, the bed on which he is being carried. Now if he is paralyzed, we know that his muscles would have withered. There has been atrophy there. He, and as we know, even if we spend a week in bed, it's very difficult for us to rise up all at once. But he gets up fully cured, and he picks up this bed, which four men had been carried through. He was lying on it, but he carries it by himself. And he who had been brought is told to go and go to thy house. And he rose, and he went into his house. And the multitude, seeing it, feared, and they glorified God. Our Lord came into this world to destroy the works of Satan. He didn't come to heal bodies, but to heal souls. If he came to heal bodies, what benefit is it to us? We came 2,000 years too late. But if he came to heal souls, then it's the greatest benefit to us. Because his power for forgiving sin, which flows from his divinity, and which is made manifest in his blood, 
is continually being applied to us today. And so we can see that the church's doctrine, which is summed up for us in the creed, we believe in the communion of saints. Our prayers, our sacrifices, our sufferings are able to contribute to the salvation of others. The man's friends, their believing was the means by which, was the means the Lord used to forgive the man's sin and to bring him help. Why should this stop today? So we, in our afflictions, should never think they're wasted. But if God has sent us some affliction, some cross, some difficulty in life, let us embrace it and offer it for the salvation of those who do not believe. What did Our Lady teach? What prayer did the children at Fatima learn? I believe, I adore, I trust, I love. I beg pardon for those who do not believe. Do not trust. Do not hope. Do not adore. Do not know you. This is the communion of saints. The Lord also teaches us about the forgiveness of sins. And again, we have that in the, in the creed. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and so on. Let us then be encouraged. The Lord has called us his children. Let us be encouraged, knowing that it's possible, even today, for the Lord to touch us through the prayers of one another, of each other, and above all, through the prayers of the church. Let us ask then that our faith in Christ might increase day by day, that we be firmly convinced and convicted that he loves us and that he continues to be with us and will be with us now and forever. Let us ask also that he lead us to our home, which is his home, the home of our Father in heaven, to whom be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.